Please uh, in, and I think another two minutes or three minutes, uh, we should be online, and let's let's see how it goes. I'm quite excited about it, though. Uh, about the questions, many of the questions are already answered in the discussion, so mm -hmm. I'll avoid those questions. If I get any question that is uh, not been discussed, then I'll ask. Right. But in my experience, in last uh, two weeks, almost all questions are answered by within panel discussions. Yeah, that's right. So, so rarely there okay. is a question which comes up. Yeah, and also people generally have a tendency not to ask, as you know. Even yeah. in the conferences, they just keep quiet. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's also uh, not been discussed, and I'll ask. I think we'll raise our own question between... Exactly. Our... That is much better than yeah. Uh, yeah. people asking questions which are not very relevant and things like that. Mm -hmm. Dr. Shyam, uh, what is the audience actually? Orthopedic surgeons or uh, yes. mix of yes. everything? Orthopedic surgeons only. Right, right. Okay, got it. So we can, uh, I can keep the answers in perspective of that. Exactly. Yeah. Now we are relying it on Ortho TV. Uh, so everybody, only orthopedic surgeons are members of that group. So no, no. Um, uh, I, I think I think he uh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I think he meant uh, whether they are specialist arthroscopic or shoulder surgeons mainly or... Uh, yeah, yes. that's what I meant. Yeah. yeah. No, everybody will be able to watch. They are general. You can you can presume it is a general orthopedic crowd. Got yeah. it. Got it. So we just have one minute to go. Yeah. I love my camera for some time. Okay. There is some audio issue in my laptop, so I have joined uh, via my cell phone. Yeah, is, you're audible. Okay, good. So. I think we are ready to go, sir. We can proceed. Okay. Can we start? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, let me welcome you all to this uh, webinar on tips for mini open cuff repair. Uh, to start with, I must thank and applaud Ashok for doing this wonderful job. Ashok and his team. And, you know, I'm myself hooked on to Ortho TV almost every day. And I've learned so much myself, even on topics on which I thought I'm quite good. So thank you very much, Ortho TV, for giving this opportunity to the whole nation. And this has actually come up, or may come up as a future way of learning, actually, even when the lockdown is gone. Uh, today, let, us, let me present you this webinar, which is titled Tips for Doing Mini Open Cuff Repair. To me, once I thought maybe I'm, uh, you know, ek Hindi mein kaha hai. there's a saying in Hindi, uh, ulte baas bareli ko. Oh, you're trying to, you know, swim against the trite. So when the whole world is talking about arthroscopic cuff repair, here is Dr. Maheshwari and team who wants to talk about mini open cuff repair. And so uh, that kind of a feeling did come, but then I realized maybe it is important to talk about this for the reasons which I'll come to. Uh, I must say, right in the beginning, almost 99% of my cuff repairs are arthroscopic. But still, I feel there is a scope for mini open cuff repair in situations which I'll allude to very soon. Now, the origin of this webinar came because in January this year, we organized a one-day seminar on clinical examination of the shoulder, what we call ODOT, which means one day, one topic. That means the whole day, we discuss only one topic, and on 26th of January this year, the topic was shoulder examination. At the end of the meeting, one of my senior colleagues told me, and I would say in Hindi, Peter, uh, he says, Doctor, kya fayda? Diagnosis to bana lete hain, kuch kar to sakte nahi. Kuch hame aisa batao ki hum bhi kuch kar paayin. So to translate for Peter, 
he said there's no point in learning how to diagnose a shoulder problem because we can't do anything we have to refer it to you so why don't you tell us something that we can do and there he requested me to prepare a video to teach how to do a mini open cuff repair and i thought oh, maybe that's a good idea and that's the origin of this webinar let me uh, welcome formally my colleagues uh, peter campbell to start with who was my mentor and i learned all my arthroscopy with him and he is a very prolific very very well established surgeon in australia and perth and more importantly after having done lots and lots of arthroscopic rotator cuff repair peter does now almost all of them mini open it's not we are not you know, going against the tribe believe in it and that's why he is here uh, my other colleague dr kanchan patacharya who is from calcutta and kanchan and we have more or less grown together in different parts of the country but we have kind of learned things ourselves unlike a lot of youngster people who have opportunity to learn going and working with people and then i have my two young very enthusiastic colleagues dr sanjay trivedi and dr shashank who are my you know powerhouse whenever there is something you can just throw it on them and they will give it back to you in so many ways and you know really excite you to think so thank you very much all of you for being here and with that i will start my presentation and i hope you can see it on the screen is it on dr sham i can yes. see it okay can i go go ahead sir okay so this is title tip for mini open cuff repair uh mini open in 2020 as i told you looks something like you are living in the past and let me see what the literature says so first time i give a talk on mini open cuff repair was in 2009 i think this was a arthroscopy conference in ahmedabad and that time i repair uh, reviewed the literature and this is a slide from that presentation it showed no difference in 2009 there was no difference between mini open and open whatever way so many things so it was kind of equal to arthroscopic cuff repair and then i thought when i was preparing for this let me see what has happened in last 10 years so have things changed in 2020 so i reviewed from 2009 onwards and i was surprised even in as late as 2019 there is no difference there is no difference one after another meta analysis saying that there is no difference between mini open and arthroscopic cuff repair now that was a bit of a surprise because i was expecting over a period of time as technology of arthroscopic cuff repair has has improved so much there must be difference but as of today no that's not the case there are a few studies which do favor arthroscopic repair particularly they say it's a shade better of course less pain of course more cosmetic for the patient and patients love it there's no doubt even if the results are same patients like to do it arthroscopic way just because it is kind of you know keyhole surgery there is a less tear rate in one of the studies they mention of course infection is expected to be slightly more in open surgeries than mini open i accept this but that is what is the little bit shade better phenomena though at the end of 6 months there is no difference in even these studies so if we know what happened 6 months later mini open versus arthroscopy even as late as 220 there is no difference now there are some changes that have happened in last few years in practice of shoulder surgery number one is because of availability of uh, you know uh, mri these are being diagnosed more often now i mean just because everybody can walk into a mri center there are 100 mri centers even in delhi so patient just walk into a tear, if they're not improving they just go in and they find out there is a tear there and once there is a tear they are looking for a doctor who can fix the tear and as you know not all can reach arthroscopic surgeon it's a huge country with you know pockets where there's a good arthroscopic surgery being done is it possible is it something that we can expect that a patient from you know interiors of india would travel all the way to delhi bombay calcutta or the major city to get his arthroscopic uh, rotator cuff tear done difficult logistically as well as financially and of of course the arthroscopic cuff repair has a big learning curve even for people who are aspiring to become arthroscopic shoulder surgeon they want to do arthroscopic cuff repair it is quite a lot of learning curve but doing good mini open is also not that simple and we have done it i have done it myself and my colleagues will vouch for it it's not all that simple just because it is open it has its own you know nonsenses 
So these are tips I would like to give you if you want to uh, try doing mini open cuff repair, maybe some of the surgeons who have reasonable skills of open surgery, I'm sure most orthopedic surgeons do have, and also for surgeons who are graduating into doing it arthroscopic way, we'll have to at least stop some time to do a mini open, and some of these tips may help. To give you a brief message, I would say do mini open arthroscopic way, which means we have learned a lot of things from arthroscopic surgery, which you incorporate in mini open, it will make your life simpler. And that's what I'm going to talk, talk to you about in this seminar. So what are the issues in doing a mini open surgery? First is exposure and visibility. There's a small tight space and you have to see everything. And we orthopedic surgeons are used to just cutting it open, you know, six inch incision, we can see everything nicely. And when you have to see through a small window, even in open surgery, that's not something normally we like doing. We want to see everything that we are doing. And that's a problem with mini open in the cuff repair because there's hardly any space there. Now identifying the cuff and it's an me. Cuff breaks, it goes here and there. You don't know what is going to be there. And that's a little bit of an art to learn what is going to be fixed where. And of course, the repair techniques. You want to take a bite in the tendon. It is a small space. How do you turn your needle? What kind of needle do you use? And that's a lot of fiddling involved there because less space, you can't see much. Your assistant is not there to help you because you cannot do much because you're working inside a deep well. So these are the issues which make even a mini open cuff repair fairly difficult. So let me tell you, what do you do? Exposure. I do these mini cuff repairs in a sitting position, more so to save my own shoulder and my own neck. But I'm sure it can be done very easily in lateral decubitus position. No problem at all. A lot of people do it in that position. OT light, to adjust your OT light in such a way that it shows deep down in the wound is often difficult. So if you have available in your OT headlight, which is very often available, it's a good idea in the beginning to have that to help you with you know, visualization and illumination in the depth of the wound. Very handy instrument is arthroscopic cable. One of your assistant can move that cable there and again illuminate inside of the subacromial space nicely. Of course, you have need a set of retractors, self-retaining because there's a small space. You can't have too many people playing there. You should have a self-retaining retractor and different sizes of right angle retractor depending on the thickness or the you know, girth of the shoulder. Some of the general instruments which come handy, uh, marker pen is very important in shoulder. You have to mark the anatomy skin marking, then self-retaining retractors as I've shown here. And very handy is the sutures. On the left is the number five ethibon, which is handy in repairing. Uh, when you cut something, I'll show you how. And on the right is a, a fiber wire on a small needle, which comes handy. And these things are now available. If you plan to do a mini open cuff repair, you can actually ask a vendor to provide you all these things. They're available easily and they can be in your OT and help you with things. Of course, a cutter in case uh, sometime I have to, you know, take a sliver of the bone from the acromion and I'll show you how to do it. You, can, you may need a cutter. Nibbler is good to take out the bursa, etc. A small sharp osteotome because often you have to do acromioplasty and your normal blunt osteotome can actually fracture the acromion. So you have to keep one sharp osteotome for this uh, if, you, if you try to do uh, acromioplasty with the help of this. And these small needles very often are not available in a normal operation theater. And if you're taking the patient for a cuff repair, you need small needles which can be moved around inside the subacromial space. So these are the things you have to organize in case you're planning a mini open. And this is next. Of course, not everybody who does open surgery will have access to these. But a lot of theaters these days, a lot of guys are doing mini open or they're doing you know, knee surgery, arthroscopic surgery. So some of the time these things are available. More so if you're doing a cuff repair using an anchor, in India at least the vendors actually supply you quite a few of these things. To start with, if you can see there's a switching stick which can be used as your finger inside to move around. Grasper, which can be used to grasp the tissue and you can lock it. So there's no, it's a self-holding kind of a forceps in your hand and you have a suture lasso, I'll tell you how to use it to pass sutures, also a Scorpio kind of a device, how to pass sutures, I'll show you in the presentation in the video. Knot pusher is again extension of my finger. Sometimes you have to knot deep in the subacromial space, your finger doesn't go, your assistant can't hold it. So knot pusher is a little bit uh, useful device, it needs a little bit of a learning, not a too much of a learning. But I think these things, if you have handy, it'll really make your uh, mini open cuff repair a cakewalk. 
Of course, you should keep a bar in case you want to decompress the acromion. Sometimes you don't want to use the osteotome, uh, worrying about fracture in elderly person. You can use a bar and just decompress with the help of that. So these are arthroscopy instruments which are very handy to make your life easy. So number one, I'll come to exposure part of it. So that's the diagram which shows how the acromion looks from top. Anteriorly, there is anterior part of the deltoid, then lateral part of the deltoid, and that's where you are working, anterolateral incision. You can do one thing, you can just split the uh, deltoid between the anterior and the middle part, go all the way up to the acromion, and just open this space. If it is a small tear, you are lucky, not much bleeding, you will see everything very well, you don't need to do anything more. But sometimes the tear is retracted, and just by this opening, you cannot see. So what you do is you start pulling here and then you ask your assistant to pull and that actually lands up damaging the deltoid more than uh, what may be uh, uh, you know, required. So what I do is I take away anterior, uh, you know, about a centimeter and a half of the acromion with five millimeter bone with it, either with the help of a uh, bone cutter, sharp bone cutter, or even a small, you know, a small saw. And with that goes my front of the uh, muscle with that, which is, which will make it easier for me to suture it later. So whatever I cut has to heal when I suture it. So I take a sliver of the bone to be sure that I can suture that part of the deltoid back. Occasionally, when it is a real tough situation, even with this, it is not helping me. And I'll show it in the video. I even take away one centimeter of the deltoid from the lateral part, which means this part. And that actually opens up the book. I can do without it, but I know by pulling and pushing, actually I'm causing more harm to deltoid. I don't mind detaching it because I can suture it well later on and I'll show you this. This may not be always required for, for a beginner when you're struggling and you're retracting the deltoid here and there, you're actually causing more harm. But you must know how to remove it and how to suture it. So bursal excision is a very important tip. You use a finger under the, uh, under the deltoid to you know, free the deltoid in a way and you'll find the tissue under your finger is uh, actually a bursa, and as soon as you identify the plane between the bursa and the cuff, life become easy. Then you can just chop off all the bursa with the help of a scissors or even a nibbler. Nibbler is a good device because you can't really take your cuff out with a nibbler. It is very difficult. You have to be really crazy to take the cuff out. But if you gently kind of start lifting the tissue, it will be bursa mostly, which will come in your hand and gradually you will remove all the bursa and clear that space. After that comes acromioplasty, which is not now common with arthroscopic surgery, but with mini open, it's a good idea to remove a under surface of maybe half of the acromion with the help of a sharp osteotome, the way I've shown it here. It serves two purposes. One, it takes away that spike for you. And this is another osteotome, which is suppressing the head. So it takes away the spike and also kind of, and shows you better because you have more space now. If not, you can always use a burr, just remove that part of the bone with the help of a burr, so you don't run the risk of fracturing. You can always smoothen this with the help of a rasp if it is available, but the idea is to have a smooth under surface of the chromium, and you can put your finger, and if your finger goes easily there, it is enough subacromial decompression and definitely enough to be able to see inside. So that's a step important in open surgery. Not only does it help for decompression, it also helps in visualization. It gives you that extra, you know, five, 10 millimeter. Now, next important step is identification of the cuff. And I always say, if it is easily visible, it may not be cuff. Don't jump on to repairing that something that you can see easily. Very often in chronic tears, the edge of the bursa is so thick, it almost looks like, you know, edge of the tendon and you will be very happy suturing it wherever, which serves no purpose. So if it is easily visible, stop and think, is it really a thick bursa or is it a tendon? Identify the cuff from intact anterior and posterior margin is the trick. And if you can't see the cuff because you see a gadda there, a hollow space, just move the shoulder anterior posteriorly. You will see some margin, either anterior or posterior, which is the cuff. And from there, you can start tracing rest of the cuff. So if you rotate, you'll find some cuff attached somewhere, which will guide you to the rest of the cuff. And as soon as you see that cuff margin attached to the head anywhere, you start taking stay suture and gradually you'll find whole of the cuff margin can be brought into the wound with the help of stay sutures. Now, these are the usual pattern. Crescent is very friendly, very common. Anybody can do it mini open very, very quickly. 
and sometimes we have a reverse L or a L-shaped, which means though they look like round inside, but they're actually not round. They have come off like this, either from here and this end has to come here. Or in this case, this end has to come here. You have to recreate the L or reverse L. Now that comes with some experience of trying to move this edge if it comes here easily or if it comes that way easily. That's a little bit of a learning curve there to find out whether it is L-shaped or reverse L-shaped. Crescent is simple. Then you have a big tier, which are U or V. You don't even know what kind of tear it is. And I'll tell you how to go about repairing them. And once you have some idea about where, which part of the tear is going to be, then you can plan surgery in a better way. For example, this is a crescent tear and you hold with a grasper and you can pull it laterally like this. It is sitting very well. You know it needs just one suture here and one suture here like this and everything is okay. Similarly, if it is a reverse L shape and you pull this here and it can come there, you know it is going to close something like this. So you put one anchor, one anchor and then close the gap. So idea about how the tear really looks can give you a idea about anatomical repair. That's very important to repair the tendon where it belongs. You can't just put sutures everywhere and put it on the GT. That is not going to heal. Now, if it is a big tear, which means U and V-shaped tear, which happens sometimes and it's a very struggle some period, then you have to somehow, this is deep into the wound, very difficult to actually reach there. And you may take a stay here, stay here, bring it closer to you, but still. So there you have to put what is called margin conversion suture. You suture this part to this part, this part to this part, and it will look something like this. Now it is more handleable. You can put suture anchors on the side like this and complete the tear. So it's a combination of margin conversion to make your tear look smaller and you can handle this kind of a tear better than this tear. So that's the technique you can learn. So this is a small video and I would just uh, present it to you uh, about, it's a 10 minutes video about what are the tips in real time mini open cuff repair. And this is the one I prepared about a month back. These are the general instruments again. More importantly is keep the sutures with you. These are not usually available in the uterine operation theater. You have to actually organize. And these arthroscopy instruments, some of them may be there if your colleague is doing arthroscopic surgery, but some of them can be actually asked from the vendor. Suture lasso, for example. And as I alluded already, small needles are not in the operation theater. You have to keep these things as if you're going to do arthroscopy, though you're not doing arthroscopy. Now, this is a suture lasso. For those who have not used it, it's a kind of a needle holder fixed with a needle. So there's no fiddling between the needle and the needle holder. And you push it from the behind and make a loop here. So there's no nobody trying to hold the needle. This thread comes out easily. You take it there and make a knot. And with this, you can, you know, pull it through the tissue. So there's no needle, needle holder. This is a combination of needle and needle holder. So no fiddly. And once you pull it, the tissue goes, the, the thread goes through the tissue and it's easy. You can do it in deeper part of the joint where your needle holder can't reach or you, are, you can't hold it, the needle holder with the help of a forcep. There's another very handy device called uh, Scorpio or different uh, from different companies that are differently where you pass the needle takes the suture and you can actually pull this instrument it will take the suture. Just to show you in a model, uh, this is a self-detaining, self-holding suture device that the suture comes through the tissue and when you withdraw the instrument, it actually takes it. It's all in one, just one go. Exposure, I have already talked about. You can go only straight deltoid splitting. You can go anterior. You can go anterior plus lateral. It all depends. As long as you can suture it back nicely. Dr. Meshwari, you want me to stop? Yeah, just a minute. Uh, uh, this is uh, something. Um, can you throw a little bit more light on how you repair the deltoid acromion back to it? So I'll come to that at the end of it. Okay, okay. That's there in this video. Okay. So I've already talked about exposure step by step. This is the real time video now. You must mark. It is easy to mark posteriorly the acromion. As you come in the front of the acromion, it's not that easy where my finger is because the head is there. So sometimes you have to pull the head down to really feel the anterolateral border of the acromion. It's not at the, all that simple. And that is the axillary nerve, so I know my line. So I made a little biggest incision here because of recording. Uh, as you know, the skin on the shoulder is mobile. You can do all this through half-size incision by making a mobile window. 
So you can go, uh, you know, subcutaneous, mobilize this window, and then you can actually manage to do a smaller incision. I would suggest initially, uh, don't, don't kind of hesitate to make a bigger incision. Then I find out where my acromion tip is. And in that line with a cautery, I go about, you know, 80%, not 100% because I don't want to burn the deeper tissues. And once it is 80% down, then I use a scissors to go to the space under the um, deltoid, put my finger. My finger is now feeling under surface of the acromion. And I know I'm in the right place. And I remove rest of it. You can stop here and start working. But in this particular case, just to show, I detached front and lateral side of the deltoid. Now, this is not, maybe it was not required in this case, but I thought just to show how it is done and how we repair. So lateral side about one centimeter, one and a half centimeter. You can, you know, decorticate or maybe remove the under surface as I have already shown earlier like this. Take out that piece that helps in visualization and you can actually remove the pieces. Don't leave those loose pieces of bone there whatever they are, and then put your finger. I can put my finger easily means it is enough space for me now. And now I can start rotating and see what is happening. In this particular case, as, as you can say, the front part is okay. Now I can see my whole subscapular is here. Biceps is hidden behind this front flap, which means front part of the delt, uh, rotator cuff is fine. And I'm rotating it out. I can see my subscap okay. So it's basically tear extending from supra, which is here. So I'm taking a bite in the front flap just to have a control on that. And all these sutures with, you know, loaded needles are always better. Now this is another part of the cup which I'm holding. See, I cannot, I, I can use a needle and a needle holder, but it's very fiddly. So this suture lasso comes very handy when you're walking in deeper parts. And once you've got the grasp of, the, see grasper on my left hand, instead of using a normal forceps, this grass phase is more or less self-locking. Once I hold it and lock it, my job is done. And then I use a suture lasso to pass wherever I want to pass because my grass fur is very handy. And now I want to see what kind of a tear is it. Now I can see my tear is L, reverse L-shaped and this part of the cuff has to come here. And so if I put two anchors here, my job is done. I can close the interval. Next comes preparation of the footprint. You can use a cautery initially. If your cuff is too tight, then you can remove a part of the you know, cartilage also. You can make it five millimeter or six millimeter more medium. You can put anchors here rather than here. So it all depends on how much tension. You can't do a repair under tension. So first anchor, these are all self-loaded anchor with needles attached to them. And they're available from even local vendors, reasonably good quality, I would say. And you, if you're cost conscious, you can use that. And as you can see in right hand is the grasper, which is a locked grasper. So I'm done. I don't have to hold it again and again. And it doesn't slip every now and then. And then with these already loaded fixed needles, I can take bites. With the loose needles, sometimes it's very difficult. You know, the needle holder slips here and there and you actually struggle. So these needles where the suture is actually loaded on the needle is very handy. Initially, though it may cost some money, but it will make your life easy. So you can take whatever kind of sutures. I will not go into the details. I've used uh, mattress sutures here, which means all the four sutures have gone through the tissue. And in this case, there was a lamination. So I don't, I take both uh, superior and inferior lamination. So first anchor, all the four uh, sutures have gone through. Now I decide where my next anchor is going to go. So I put that anchor there and do the similar job. So if it is handy, you can use a needle holder. If it is not handy, you can use a lasso. If it is still not handy, you can even use uh, the, the Scorpio kind of a device if it is available. So here I've used a needle holder because this needle is fixed and it is visible very nicely. This is a suture Scorpio device where you have to just catch the tissue and just fire it. It will automatically catch the suture as you see here and one go. No big deal, no, no forcep to be used, nothing to be used. And then once you've done it, you start repairing from one end. You can put whatever suture, if it is deep, superficial, you can do with your fingers, no problem at all. But sometimes these sutures are deep and your finger actually cannot go that tight and your assistant cannot hold the knot. Then these, you know, the, the knot pushers, if you have a little bit experience, they come very handy because you can see everything. 
so you can use these arthroscopy instruments with some little bit of training to do a good mini open repair and that's what i have learned after doing arthroscopic repair that why not use these instruments to make your life easy and in this case what i did was i even created a lateral post so i could have used a screw the screw wasn't available in my ot at that time but i just passed a thick uh, you know number 5 ethy bond created a loop from the ethy bond and then i tied all the sutures laterally like a lateral post you can do it you may not do it if you believe in suture bridge this is what you do otherwise even a single low repair is good enough uh, at least in the beginning if you don't believe in any double row which is all right so i created this post with the help of ethy bond and all the left out sutures were tied there so my the suture the, the margin of the uh, cuff was sitting nicely on the footprint and they were stable and i could move it every there i could have closed the anterior interval between the but i i think in this case i thought it is okay i can leave it as it is so that is the cuff and you can move it you can see how stable it is and that can help you now this is the repair part shisham so you have to take number 5 at the bond this needle is very sturdy you can take it mattress through the tissue with the fascia that means the deltoid always mattress suture in the deltoid you can take one or two sutures in the acromion and this needle goes very easy and you can really tighten it very nicely and it is a non absorbable suture it holds very well doesn't cut out because there is a fascia there same about lateral as you can see take the fascia along if you take only the muscle it might just cut out and always a mattress on both sides it can also cut out from the acromion if you are if your acromion is not good quality so it's good to have you know both sides mattress and this needle is very good you can take sutures like this and believe me it, it looks very good when you repair it and i don't think it makes me uncomfortable in any way trying to mobilize after doing this kind of a deltoid lifting i avoid doing it but in the beginning i think it's a good idea if you can repair it that way which is not a big deal and all this is repaired and then you go deeper and in a usual way by continuous suture or intermittent suture close your deltoid split <clears throat> just a regular you know running stitch is good enough and then you can close the skin whatever way you like so this is one patient done the same way you know and does very well I and mean, doesn't need today my mobilization of arthroscopy mini open is no different because i trust my repair i trust my closure not a problem except that it is a little bit more painful in the mini open that's it and so mini open repair is a valid option even in 2020 and we have peter here who has done all arthroscopy all his life and now does mini open left right and center use arthroscopy instruments initially it might make your life easy in doing these surgeries start with smaller tears where just a split may be enough if you are struggling open up more as i have declared now climb up the ladder of learning for those who are doing arthroscopic shoulder surgery you can always do mini open to start with after doing diagnostic arthroscopy you can see arthroscopy maybe decompression remove the bursa and then do mini open or you can do all arthroscopic repair as you become smarter and smarter with your techniques of doing arthroscopic repair i think with me that is the end and uh, now we can have some question answers maybe panelist have to make some comment that will be a good idea first Yes, sir. Yeah, how about Sanjay? Hi. Uh, can you hear me now? My yeah. Microphone. Yeah. Okay. So, Dr. Maheshwari, the single question: Why do you use anchors for mini open? You know that your bone is as strong as it comes, and all the repairs are always compared against the mini open repair when we do it arthroscopically in all series. So. i just uh, uh, don't understand when you open it up the bone is there you can always do in indian scenario a very cheap transosseous repair by using the same instrument same needles so can you just yeah so, like okay so i uh, i would say eventually if you become good it is possible initially there are two things one 
when somebody takes a bite from the GT and wants it to come out exactly at the footprint, the needle may not come out where you want it to come unless you have some kind of a sea guide. Okay. Now, if you have a sea guide, you know exactly where your needle should come out on the footprint. That may not happen every time with not so experienced people. Second, you have to take multiple bites, you know, one, two, three. Why do you want to stress yourself? I know cost is an issue, but at least in the initial period, use an anchor because that takes away that extra bit of a stress of taking the needle from the GP. And it should come out every time exactly where you want it to come out. That's number one. Number two is very often, you know, if you take two superficial a bone bite, which I'll go to at the bone needle, if you take five, six of them, at least I fear I may end up fracturing the GT. You know, sometimes the GT is very hollow. So with experience, you can do it. I agree. But initially, when somebody was beginning to do, I think it is worth spending that money on a anchor, which takes a major part of your headache. So, uh, I would suggest that if you are uh, doing transversal, just make a loop and pass, do only two or three holes, and you can pass all the sutures. Uh, you know, two or three suture in a single hole and you can do a very beautiful transversius. And there is a technique and it's about five needle is a good to pierce through this uh, actually uh, greater tuberosity directly without any hesitation. All open surgeons will yeah, be comfortable with it. I agree with you. It's possible to do it transversius if you are tuned to doing what you want to do and you're good at getting it out exactly with the footprint. I agree with you. It's possible. Uh, Peter, uh, would you uh, would you like to say something on this? Um, Transosseus is a viable repair technique in anyone. It's cheaper, but in the elderly, especially the elderly with osteoporosis, which in our society they're the majority of patients having rotator cuff repairs, Transosseus does have a risk of fracture and pull out of the greater tuberosity, as Jatenda has just mentioned. Anchors used the correct way, placed in the correct position at the correct angle, actually have a lesser risk of, of failure in the elderly osteoporotic than transosseous. But that's if you have the ability to use them or you can afford them. So yes, there is, a, there is still a place for anchors, even, even with an open repair. And not only that is that it also, it aids the surgeon by making the whole thing a lot faster. Uh, Sanjay, uh, you said about passing uh, loop sutures to two or three holes, whereas uh, Dr. Maheshwari has this concern, which I have too, that even making those two or three tunnels, starting from the lateral cortex and trying to come out in the GT, any special tip you do? Well, uh, as uh, you know, uh, Dr. Maheshwari said, I have prepared a kind of a uh, you know, passing like a cobbler stool. C, C guide, like, like a C guide. It's a, it's C a modified guide, C guide. Yeah. yeah, it's a cobbler tool. I do not have the, uh, you know, picture to give you right now, but yes. it, it, which, uh, with an eyelet at the tip and you pass it gradually by curving it, it is a just, a, you know, C guide and with experienced surgeon, it should be really easy. And it is not, it does not create a very big hole actually. Hmm. And it's a valid point, but in osteoporotic bone anchors, we have also felt that uh, has a pull out. The only trick is to use a metallic anchor and push it right up to the subcortical, subchondral uh, region to have a good purchase in those osteoporotic things. But in fact, I have salvaged my anchor pull out at times with the transosseous taking care of this, uh, you know. Um, GT disruption, avoiding GT disruption by using this uh, uh, kind of uh, C guide. It is always in my arthroscopic. Okay, so can we can we can we conclude this part by saying that transosseous is possible? You can save money, but you should be careful of two careful. things. One, not so much osteoporosis and GT, because as you know, the best bone is just next to the cartilage, which is much yeah, much sure. better. So sure. if you are if you are okay and you have some such jugad you know, technology which Sanjay has created, it's okay. Otherwise, for a for a beginner, it may be an unnecessary stress. I just add forward. forward. I'll just add one more thing to that. Yeah. That is uh, again following a very old technique of open repair. Yes. They used to use 
a marceline tape or a decadel tape with needles on both sides. And those needles are very strong. And you can make a transosseous tunnel with this. And you know, we are replicating all that have been, we've been doing open. You can use the marceline tape and do the same thing that we do with tapes nowadays. And it creates a pretty big hole, you know. So, okay. put the so tape, uh, what, what can we... Can we move on to uh, another? Yes, yes. Maybe if there's any question, any question, Dr. Sham from the from the attendee. Uh, yeah, there are quite a few questions. I'm just gonna take them now. There's a question by Dr. Chandra from Nagpur. Yeah. Any tips on increasing working space below the acromion? So that is the trick I have given. So one is how do you split your deltoid? So either you can go straight, you can lift it from anterior with a, with a piece of bone. And I use a micro saw and I lift anterior about five millimeter of the acromion with my deltoid. That makes my deltoid repair very sure because there is a you know five millimeter acromion there. Similarly, from the lateral side, if I have to remove, I will take my micro saw and remove five millimeter because I'm more concerned about the repair part of it. But let me tell you, even if you take with a, without a saw, with a knife or a periosteum, take a periosteum with it, and you repair the fascia as I showed you in the video, it's not a big deal. So that's one number one. Number two is always do a chromioplasty. Remove a chromium under surface five millimeter. If it is an old man, don't use the osteotome, use a burr. Burr really gives you a lot of space to work. And with these two things, your visibility of the depth of the wound improves. Number three, you can ask your assistant to actually pull it down for some time till you can actually catch the margins of the cuff. I think these are the three tips for improving the visibility. All right. Uh, uh, Dr. Maheshwari, uh, sorry, Ashok, carry on, please. Can we go to the next question? Yeah, I have another question. Uh, what is the advice of panel to do microfracture holes in GT for better healing of cuff? Microfracture on the GT. Shishang, would you like to answer this? Yeah, yeah. I have been uh, doing it for last 10 years. Uh, um, because Mainly because not, I don't see many people doing it, but because being trained under Snyder, I have seen it. Uh, the literature is sparse. Uh, you make small holes just lateral to the uh, rear repaired edge. Um, make sure that you don't use something very big, something like a steam and pin. You will end up fracturing it. Uh, something like a K wire, very thin K wire uh, to make multiple holes. Uh, I do it, whether it makes a difference, I really don't know. It, so it, it, can, it can be done. Any panelist would differ from this? Any reason? Yes, about I, yes I, I, I differ. Um, I do it routinely. I always have, but I use a U-shaped awl to do it. If you use a slime and pin or anything round, you're right. placing it into cancellous bone. You just compress the bone and you actually minimize the vascular ingrowth. So if you're going to do microfracture, you have to do it with a U-shaped instrument that actually cuts a channel, not just compresses the bone to the edges of it. And the introducer of most anchors are U-shaped. So you just use the anchor um, right. introducer. Okay. okay. Any, you, any mean, you mean to say you use one of the anchors before putting them in place, just lateral to the place, just makes a few yeah, holes? Put, I, well, I do a double row technique. So I put my inner row anchors in on the articular margin, and then I take the introducer to, for my micro, so not so my micro fracture, to make my vascular ingrowth channels before I put my lateral row in. And okay. it's just been shown that if you use anything round, it will just compress the bone. It will not create a vascular channel. Okay. So, uh, uh, Sham, any other question? Yeah, there is a question from Dr. Mukesh Ladda. He asked that, uh, he's, he, he's commenting about transosseous repair, that GT is osteoporotic in chronic cases and there is a chance of GT fracture. Will it be technically demanding for new surgeons, the transosseous repair? Yeah, there is, there is a little catch between what you want to spend. And if, if you're at all doubtful as a, as a beginner, and if you can see osteoporosis on the X-ray, I would say play safe, use anchors. Right. So are you trying to say in osteoporotic bone, anchors are more reliable compared to transosseous tunnel? Yes, because of two reasons. One, where you put the anchor is the best bone in that area, just next to the articular margin. Even if your GT is completely hollow, that area has sub-subgondral bone all the time. Yeah. So even then it will hold. 
You can just and bury your anchors right up to the subchondral bone, and that is the best uh, thing to do in osteoporosis. Right, right, right. Okay. And the, uh, anchors, the anchors have to be at the correct angle too. Uh, not only yeah, at, sure. the, at the articular margin, it has to be at right angles to the subsequent pull sure. of, the, of the tendon. Right. Uh, yes, next, Dr. Ashok. Yeah, what are the chances of deltoid dehiscence uh, uh, in your experience? Uh, well, uh, now it is not done often, but uh, I know that when you repair it like this, I don't see any reason why it will have dehiscence. Particularly if I'm having either a sliver of bone and or if I'm, I'm taking the fascia with it. It's a, it's a mattress suture, only a small area of one centimeter. Uh, theoretically, even if nothing heals there, that one centimeter front and laterally, I don't think it is going to make much difference to power of the deltoid. So I, I think that is a theoretical worry. But if you remove it properly and suture it properly, with currently available suture material, which are non-absorbable, number five ethibond, mattress suture through the tissue, as well as through the acromion, I, I feel very secure that I don't think these sense is an issue. All right. Any, any, any uh, panelists would uh, differ on this? In case you have to open up, I don't know. Uh, you are expert, so, you may not be opening up at all. Only in the The essence is cosmetic, it's not functional. So if you have a one to two centimeter dehiscence, you end up with a trough, which is cosmetic. The, uh, the deltoid still functions normally, but the patients don't often like the appearance. Yeah, that, that's possible. Purest, purest mini open is where you do not touch the deltoid. And once you touch the deltoid, it becomes standard open rotator cuff repair. So most of the panelists probably are doing mini open all the time. Yeah, so idea idea was, you know, I've, I myself struggled and I've seen my... Uh, junior struggling, doing only by split. And, yes. you know, you're struggling too much, you're retracting so much. At the end of the case, when you are suturing your deltoid, you know you have buggered quite a bit of deltoid while retracting. So I thought I better do it the other way. I detach it, keep it sacrosanct, and repair it when I have to. So, so this is not mini open in that way, but it is kind of mini open. So uh, I would like to ask Peter that uh, when you uh, fix the upper end of the humerus fracture, sometimes you see a tony of deltoid. Uh, have you ever seen anything like this when you do uh, mini opens uh, so frequently? No, see, we have to, we were all talking about oranges and apples here. When I say I do mini open, I do all the previous surgery, all the bony surgery arthroscopically. So every case right. has an arthroscopic right. component. And so my, less final, push and pull. my final repair is a deltoid split. I don't attach any deltoid through the lateral portal. I put my finger right. in, the, in the lateral portal and just split the muscle with my finger through a three to five centimeter incision, depending or the bigger the patient, the fatter the patient, the bigger the skin incision. But the muscle split is only three centimeters. And I can do it all through that. And I do it in the lateral decubitus position with the arm in traction enough traction to hold the arm at 45 degrees. That way your assistant can rotate the arm so you can get anterior to posterior and the assistant can add a little bit of traction at points for exposure. So that makes the whole thing completely doable without detaching any deltoid. So deltoid dehiscence is not a feature in my practice because I don't do a traditional uh, deltoid or the, the so-called open without any arthroscopic component as Jitenda just demonstrated. Which is perspective, Peter. yeah. Peter, at what stage do you turn open? When I've done everything. So I've done the assessment, I've done the debridement, I've done the acromioplasty, I've excised the distal end of the clavicle, if that's what it has to do. I do all the preparation arthroscopically. And finally, once I've done that, the, the repair is done as the last step. So do you pass the sutures before going open or you pass the sutures no. in, in open? No, no. Once, once I've done the, all the cleanup, then the whole repair is done open. Oh. We thank I, have a, I, have a, I have a caution for uh, surgeons uh, following Peter's approach that Peter is a very prolific, quick surgeon. If we can do that job, which he does arthroscopic within, say, 15, 20 minutes, probably it's okay. If you go too long, then the whole thing swells up so much that your mini open actually becomes difficult. So uh, you must see your own capability of how soon you can do intra-articular part, arthroscopic part, and then come so there's a right time to just decide, okay, I want to open up because I may struggle too much. I don't want to spend one hour doing arthroscopy. Yeah. 
I was just I was just saying that point to to say that I don't do the traditional, but I'm not saying that you can't do the traditional. If you do not have arthroscopy, if you don't have arthroscopic tools, the technique as Jatenda has just demonstrated is a perfectly good technique. Right. When you look but at I literature, Kanjan. Yeah, when you look at literature, most of the mini uh, repairs that are described are the way Peter does it. When you do most of the things, yeah. typically do your fixation with a mini repair, the yeah. one described by Levy in early nineties. But the one that Deetan and I are talking about, where you do everything arthroscopically and just to, add, to open everything with a mini open. And I think to an answer to the, a very valid question that came earlier is how do you improve the exposure? I think, like you, like you mentioned, Deetan, the acromioplasty is very important. But even more important is for somebody to watch a mini open being done before he does it because the burst size is so thick Unless you've seen somebody remove the bursa, you will never know how much of it to take off to go to really see where the cuff is. This is something that takes some knowing. And like you mentioned, the, you, unless you remove the bursa very meticulously and very aggressively, you will not see the cuff at all if it's torn and retracted, which they usually are. Yeah. Sanjay, before you come in, I see, see the, the, the audience for this webinar in my mind is general orthopedic surgeons, you know, all over India who will see this case tomorrow, have a rotator cuff tear. This patient can't be sent to Delhi, Bombay, Pune, and this patient can't afford. Can he take the initiative to start doing these cases? Maybe once in a month, once in two months, with whatever available technology we have discussed. All four or five of us are very experienced shoulder surgeons. Everything will be easy for us. But I, I had a focus in my mind that after seeing this, and maybe one would dare to do it. Sanjay, you want to say something? Yeah, I think uh, if our audience is general orthopedic surgeon, we should tell them that they need to read their MRIs quite uh, in detail and just figure out if it is a three centimeter or bigger tear or odd type of tear, L or reverse L, they should refrain in the beginning of their learning curve, even in the mini open or open scenario and irreparable cuff tears. So see, you and me or Peter does it just for sheer volume is so high that uh, he has to do five, seven cases in a day and he can do this thing quickly and he, he does the mini open. But for us, when I do mini open, there are limited indications. The, I think poor general health of the patient is also one of that indication where I always put arthroscope first and just you know, figure it out, what is uh, required to be done, whether it is irreparable, irreparable, and then go from there. So message would be for general orthopedic surgeons, choose a small tear, doable tear, not very retracted tear. Subscapularis we haven't discussed at all. That is one of the other area of difficulty in mini open. It can be done, but with, you need to learn tricks and tips. So avoid those kind of complex tears. That would be the message. And Shishang, would you like to uh, kind of say further on this, what kind of cases should they choose in the beginning? Yeah, uh, I think uh, that Sanjay's point is very valid. Uh, a general uh, wisdom among uh, non-shoulder surgeons is that, okay, this tear is large or massive, let's do it mini open. I think that's a trap. Uh, some uh, the, Doing a repairing a massive cuff tear where tear is extending quite back posteriorly and edges retracted is very difficult to find with a mini open approach and you end up detaching a lot of deltoid or causing a lot of trouble. So uh, don't fall into the trap that it is a large or more than four or five centimeter tear uh, and try to take it mini open. It's very difficult, uh, next to impossible, at least in my hands to do it mini open. Um, other thing is, uh, other, yes. Uh, okay, so I, I think we have 10 minutes. We'll have to go a little faster, uh, Shishang. Can I ask the speaker to give us some perspective of what happens in Australia? I was quite kind of pleasantly surprised that here is a man who is well accomplished, but does it mini open. So what is what is it in Australia? Um, well, I think you know, the reason that you look at, you do surgery in any patient, there's three factors to it. What's best for the patient, number one what's best for you as the surgeon, number two, and what's best for the system is number three. So when you think about it, I think the whole concept of arthroscopic cuff repair has been very much generated by the companies who make the equipment and they want to sell it and they make big, huge profits on it. So what's best for the patient in my hands is basically 
I think that I can I can repair a tendon better through an open exposure than through an arthroscopic procedure. It is faster. I can do the whole lot. I can do an acromioplasty, AC joint, everything else, plus a full repair bit, two or three tendons in 40 minutes from, from beginning to end. So what's best for the patient? People say that arthroscopic is better for the patients because they have less pain. Well, that's not true because it's the bony surgery that causes pain, not the tendon repair. And I've done my own study and my own practice and the pain is the same. We manage it exactly the same way. Cosmesis, yes, in India, you have a greater tendency towards keloid scarring around the shoulder than say in the Caucasian population. But if you get keloid, you get keloid, be it one linear incision or five or six puncture wounds. Yeah, so you're still gonna get keloid. So what's best for the, for the system is basically it's cheaper and faster and more greater utilization of available operating time. So therefore, for those reasons, I've gone back to doing all of my repairs as I expected. In Perth, as an example, Perth, we're, we're isolated from the rest of the world, just like Darwin's features on the Galapagos. Of the 12, of the 12 surgeons here who do the majority of rotator cuff repairs, 10 do them open. In That's Australia? In Perth. In Perth. Okay. In Perth. In other states, Sydney, Melbourne, I call it Hollywood medicine. You can call it Bollywood medicine. <laughs> they, all, they all compete against each other and they try and pretend that if you can do it arthroscopic, you're a better surgeon. And they give their patients misinformation that it's a better way of doing it. It is not. So it is very much generated by the companies and by people's egos. Okay, Dr. Shyam, do we have any questions or can we carry on like this? Uh, we have a few questions. Let, let's uh, have the audience question quickly. Yeah. So Dr. Nirmal is asking any specific indication for single row or double row repair? Uh, Peter, would you like to answer that? There is no evidence. There's no clinical evidence that a double row repair has a better end result than a single row repair. Right. Thanks. Uh, in, saying that, in saying that, I always do a double row repair. But there's no clinical evidence. There's mechanical evidence that it may be better, but there is no clinical evidence that you get a better result. Right. Yeah, Dr. Shyam. Uh, Dr. Sanjay Dhawan is asking if for a neglected tear, uh, which approach is better and why? You mean um, uh, mini open or arthroscopic is asking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay, that, that should go to maybe uh, Kanchan. We see a lot of neglected tears. We only see neglected ones. I mean, when you talk <laughs> about neglected ones, a chronic one, and I think Shashank has answered part of it. If it's a very large tear, mini open will be hard. It'd be better for people who do everything arthroscopically and then maybe convert mini, mini open to do the fixation part of it. It's not a question of chronicity of it. I think for the early, for the learners, the smaller tears, however chronic they are, will be easier managed by uh, mini open. So larger think, they are, larger they are. A lot of the neglected tears would need mobilization, etc., which is better than arthroscopic. Yes. So I would suggest don't put your hand into those. Let the shoulder surgeon struggle with those kind of cases because even they would have a lot of tough time mobilizing the tendon and sometimes you'll end up only doing partial repairs. So those are not the right cases to be done in the beginning. Any other question? Uh, there was a request that uh, can Dr. Peter demonstrate a few steps in lateral position? You can't uh, do it now. Yeah, I can't really do it now in my office. I don't have a patient here, or or an operating table. But I do have um, I do have a number of presentations. Which if someone in India will give me a site that I can load it up to, everyone can watch it. Which is a step by step way how I do a rotator cuff repair, including yeah, the arthroscopic part. Peter, well use the... ViewMedy. Use ViewMedy in India. People see ViewMedy quite often. Yeah, well, I haven't put it up. So, you see, if you, tend to, if you tend to, you just send me a message and tell me where to put it, I'll put it up. Okay, I'll do that. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I think we'll have that done. And yeah. Ashok can put it on Ortho TV later. Can That's I ask it. one question to Peter? Yes. Uh, Peter, you mentioned about the cost. Now, we have four minutes. We have four minutes. Okay. So, you mentioned about the quick, quick question. Uh, you mentioned about the uh, cost, low cost in Mini Open. You are using most of the job arthroscopically, except passing sutures. So that yeah. means you're using all the arthroscopic para paraphernalia. You're using the anchors to do the final repair or the double repair. So except for the lesser time, 40 minutes, say, compared to two hours, which I take arthroscopic, how yeah. is the cost less? 
the cost is less is because it, it, we can do more cases in a designated time because even the most optimistic studies show that for an arthroscopic repair, it takes 18 minutes more than an open repair. Now, I think that's a, a oversimplification. So, I, do so 10, I do 10 cuff repairs in a session, so that'd be a, an extra three hours of operating. Fluids, okay. fluid bags, tubing, cannulas, all the things you need to do arthroscopic, they all cost, and the companies here charge a very large premium on all those things. So it has been proven to be a lot less um, expensive even though I still use anchors. Right, I should any more questions? Yeah, this is a instrument that is photograph sent by Dr. Nish, uh, Nishit Shah. And mm -hmm. uh, he's talking about an instrument to help us make transosseous tunnel. So that's the instrument that he's using. Yeah, any... Yes, this right. is called, this instrument is the Waldemeyer Link System. It's been around since the 1970s. It has a series of three trocars and a crochet hook to retrieve suture with. I've used right. it, this, this is how I was taught to do rotator cuff repairs 30 years ago. I've modified right. this in such a way for, for surgeons in Vietnam and Cambodia, where I've made my instrument make and make it so that the, it will come out, I place it at the, at, the, at the articular margin, it comes out 16, so the curve of the instrument is designed so you have 16 millimeters of footprint where the tendon will be attached to. Right. It's a very good instrument, the Waldemeyer link. Still available. Right. Any more? We have quite a few questions, but we are running out of time. Okay. In that case, uh, let me thank uh, all the panelists for uh, giving all the useful information and their time. And thank you again, Ashok, for doing this wonderful job. And I thank all the participants for participating. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much.